particular what we call characters a character is something about an organism like a characteristic, uh, like a characteristic. so <laughs> this has a character that it's pink colored this has a character that it's got a red red eyes this has a character that it's uh, got um, a, a white. white underbelly yeah. so characters are means of uh, ways to define or organisms uh, characteristics these are all different species. They have different characters, different things about them that make them different. So the typological way is to look at an organism's characteristics and put them as a different species if they look different enough from everything else. Typological. Then there's the biological species way of defining a species. The biological way of defining a species is two organisms are the same species if they can mate with one another and have kids that can survive and also mate. So, a lion and tiger would not be already going to so we've gone over this. I want to do it again. Horse and a donkey can mate and have kids that are called mules, but the mules are sterile, so the horse and the donkey are separate species. That's the biological definition. If you use the typological way of defining species, you might say the horse and the donkey are the same species because they look pretty much the same, although in this picture the donkey is a lot smaller than the horse. Usually donkeys are smaller than horses. But there are some small horses that might look exactly like a donkey, and you might say, hey, they are the same species. But the biological would say, no, they're not because they can't mate and have offspring that are uh, fertile. You ever heard of a Z-donk? No, nope, but I've heard of a Zebroid. Oh! These are Zebroids, also sterile. I don't know. Those are pretty ugly. Then there's the phylogenetic species concept. That we look at the evolutionary history and look at the way the organisms evolved like we did in, in the human ancestry last chapter. And if something evolves along a line, we can call it its own species because of the time that it separated and the fossil evidence that we have. That's one thing the biological species concept can't do, is we can't say, for instance, using the biological species concept, we can't say that Neanderthals are their own species. Because we don't know if they could have made it with Homo sapiens. They're all extinct. But if you look at the evolutionary history, Neanderthals and modern humans diverged at a time a while back. And because of that divergence, because the fossils are found in different locations, they lived as a, we know that they lived as a group on their own evolutionarily. We'll call them their own species because they lived as their own group for a long period of time. We find fossil evidence for that. So the Neanderthals were separate from the modern humans, so we'll call them separate species. So this is using evolutionary evidence 
to make your species concept. So there's different ways to think about if two things are different species. And scientists don't always agree on which way is the best way. I talked about characters. <coughs> Modern birds have a lot of the same characters as dinosaurs. We don't think that these two are the same species. You can see that they have different species names. But we do think that they have enough in common that birds probably evolved from dinosaurs based on a lot of their similar characters. They both have hollow bones, birds and dinosaurs. Theropods, that are, that's these things, have leg, wrist, hip, and shoulder structures that are all similar to birds, leg, wrist, hip, and shoulder structures. We know that some of these dinosaurs had feathers. Did you know there were dinosaurs with feathers? I didn't know that. Because they find fossils, imprints of the dinosaurs where they died, and you can see the little feather imprints. So, and I don't know if you remember earlier, we find a lot of uh, intermediate fossils like Archaeopteryx. Do you remember that? Oh, yeah. It was like a bird slash dinosaur. It had, it looked like both together. Maybe that's another example of those structures that weren't in, like old. Yeah, maybe the dinosaur lines. mated with the bird and it was in you might find evidence for that if there were dinosaurs and birds at the same time, but there really weren't. Maybe the, maybe maybe the maybe birds that lived back then. Back then. Maybe the birds maybe that lived back then. Birds kind of came from dinosaurs. But the birds that lived back then could have been very old. Still, still chicken. They could have lived to be very beautiful. There's just not any evidence for that hypothesis, but it's an interesting hypothesis. Now, there's also uh, evidence, uh, DNA evidence, um, that is used to make uh, evolutionarily, ev evolutionary relationships between organisms. This is a, a chromosome. This is supposed to represent a chromosome. Do you remember what a chromosome is? Yeah. Remember those X-shaped things I moved around? They carry genetic information. So it's like on an X. Some ancestor had this chromosome, and they mark mutations that occur on the chromosome. They color them in on the chromosome. So some time went by, and some mutations occurred that caused two different species to evolve from the single species. The species that had these mutations, the purple and the red one, form one species. And the species that have the gray and the blue mutations form another species. This could be like the frogs that were separated. And one group of frogs changed to spotted, that's over here, and another group of frogs changed to, the other group of frogs changed to a different color. And, and that gives them their orange. mutations. And over time that can happen again. But I want you to notice something about these groups. And here we go, time happens and more mutations happen and that causes two species to come from this one. But these two species share something in common. They share the gray mutation and the blue mutation. And they both have a different one. They, and then they have an extra mutation. So what we can do is we can look through the DNA of organisms and we can look at the different mutations that result. And from that, you can come to the conclusion that these two, since they both have the gray and blue mutation, they're closely related. And this one is not closely related to these two because it doesn't have the gray and blue mutation. You see, the mutation came about in time, and that, mu that mutation will exist in all of the ancestors, in all of the uh, organisms that evolved from this one. That same mutation will probably be there, the blue, the blue and the gray one, in all later species. And will not be in organisms that come from this species. And you can use this kind of molecular data to make evolutionary trees 
And that's what we're going to work on here. Here this shows some of the uh, common mutations uh, that we find in chimpanzees, gorillas, and orangutans. And you can see they have the chromosomes here colored. And if you take some time to look at this, you can see that there are some different mutations in different organisms. Um, green, blue. You can see, just, just look at the color here. See right here, there's a red mutation in the gorilla that's not present here in the chimp. There are some differences here. And they can use these differences to construct these, these trees, what we call a phylogenetic tree. And we're going to practice making these things. Um, and let me go ahead and skip to this picture. And by the way, you'll want to turn in your book to page 496. We're going to construct a cladogram. We need to play with Plato. What's that? Oh, uh, I thought you said Plato. I was like, all right. You <laughs> I have a cladogram, a cladogram. A cladogram is an evolutionary tree based on characteristics, characters. This is using the typological species definition that we talked about before. You're going to make one, so, so pay attention to how you do this. What you do is you make a chart and put a bunch of different characters. Amniotic membrane and egg. Internal fertilization, that's like having sex. Three-chambered heart. Lungs. Vertebrae. Notochord and embryo, that's like a, like a spinal cord going, sort of like a spinal cord going in your back. It's not really a spinal cord, it's a, it's a hard structure going down the back. But anyway, then we take a number of organisms that we're studying. And we chart which characteristics, which characters these organisms have. The lancelet only has the notochord and the embryo. The eel has the notochord and vertebrae. The lizard has all of those things. And we're going to use this information. Pay attention here. You're going to do this. Tuck. You're about to make a uh, cladogram in. Yeah. Not listening to how to do it. Yeah. We're going to use this information to make a chart, an evolutionary tree. And here's how you do it. It's always shaped kind of like the letter Y. It has a long line going this way. And then coming up, it has lines going sideways like this. You'll have how many lines as organisms that you're interested in. So in this case, one, two, three, four, five. There are five organisms we're interested in. One, two, three, four, five. Okay? And what happened here during evolution was each of these characters came about at some point in the history of organisms there, there was some mutation, Drew, that caused lungs to come about. There was some mutation that caused vertebrae to come about. There was something that caused the three-chambered heart to evolve. And what we want to see is, which of these characters came first? Can you guess from looking at this chart, which of these characters came first? Not Which is the oldest character? Notochord. Okay, you say notochord and embryo. Why do you think that's the oldest character? Because all of them have it. All of the organisms have it. So it must have come about real early in evolution. Just like the mutation, if it's present in a lot of organisms, just like the chromosome mutations, probably it came long ago. So at some point, let's say way back here, there was a mutation that allowed a notochord 
And all of the organisms have that. You want us to write this down for um, you can you can write this down. You don't have to if you just pay attention. I'm going to give you your own to do in just a second. Is this our essay? I'm going to grade it. No, this is not your essay. Are we going to have? Can we write another chord for an essay and then write an essay for the other part, like I did on the other test? You, you, mean, know, you know how we had a problem sheet. You mean a cladogram? Yeah, same thing. Oh um, no, I, I, I haven't. The essay is different. We're actually going to go over the essay tomorrow. Okay, so pay attention here. Note of corn um, is first. What's the second thing to have evolved, do you think? I would think vertebrae. You would think vertebrae? Does anyone else agree? Yeah. Vertebrae came next because almost all of them have vertebrae except for the lancelet. So what that tells us is vertebrae probably came about here. And it probably came about after the lancelet evolved. So we would put the lancelet, the notochord evolves, and that leads to the lancelet. And then later, after the lancelet have, had evolved, vertebrae comes about. Some of the lancelets evolve vertebrae, and then you have your next organism. Are there organisms, uh, is there an organism that has a vertebrae but doesn't have anything else? Oh, yeah. That has a vertebrae, yeah, yeah. a notochord and a vertebrae, but nothing else. Is there an organism that you eel. see that has that? The eel. eel. The eel. The eel has the notochord and the vertebrae, those two, but it doesn't have any of this other stuff. So that's our next organism right here is the eel. Do you see how I'm doing this? I do. What was the next thing to evolve? Yeah, probably the Think lungs next? Yeah, yeah. Then the newt is. And what had lungs? Newt and the snake and the lizard. The newt had its lungs, but not the other two things internal fertilization and amniotic membrane. That's correct. And so does. Uh, the newt also has a three chambered heart, doesn't it? So look, lungs and three-chambered heart, the newt has both of those. Y'all know what a newt is? Yeah. She turned me into a newt. I got better. Possibly. What movie? Harry Potter. Harry Potter. Nope. Oh. Monty Python. Monty Python, who said that? <laughs> Very nice. Monty Python. Uh, I don't know if that's his name. So what comes after a newt? Not neutral. Ronald Weasley. A snake. Hey, what's the guy's name in Harry Potter. Ronald what? What does a snake have? Everything. So what's the next what's the next character to evolve? Internal fertilization and eminatonic membrane and eggs. Internal fertilization. And amniotic egg. And we'll we'll learn what all these are. So check this out. Snakes and lizards have all of those things. Internal fertilization and amniotic membrane. So snakes and lizards are the most closely related. See, they have everything. So this is a cladogram we've constructed from this chart that says that all of these organisms are related the, the notochord came first, and that led to a lancelet. Then vertebrae came about, and that led to an eel. Then lungs came about, and that led to a newt. Then internal fertilization and amniotic egg came about, and after that, snakes and lizards. Snakes and lizards have all these things, see? Bro, what is a lancelet? A lancelet, it looks like a fish. Oh. Um... It's a, it's a real thin, it's a long thin, it looks, it looks like a knife that swims through the water. We'll learn about that. We, we study these, we study each of these organisms. Okay. So this is the, tr this is the tree that comes about, and it's the one I just drew. That's good. The notochord and embryo is first, lancelets have that. The eel came next, they have vertebrae. 
The newt came next, they have lungs and a three-chambered heart. The snakes and lizards came next, they have amniotic egg and internal fertilization, but they have all these other things too. See, everything has what came behind it. We call these derived characters. A, a. These are each characters, and derived means they came about through evolution. So a cladogram is based on derived characters. Things that came about through evolution. Now I'm about to give you another chart. And this time you're going to make the cladogram on your own without my help. No. Wait, bro, without your help? Without my help. And if you do it successfully on your scrap sheet of paper, yep. I am going to give you 15 bonus points on a quiz. Nice. Any quiz. Any quiz. For nice. instance, if you make 100 on this quiz, I'll give you 115 if you do nice. this play right. But you're not allowed to share with anyone. You're not allowed to look for extra help. And if you can't do it, that's fine. You just don't get the bonus points. I got it. Can you okay. Up there? No, I'm, I'm giving you a new one. I know. Is it chart already? Is it already? I'll leave this chart up here. Okay. Are you ready? Yes, I'm ready. Are you ready for this? Yeah. If you didn't pay attention or don't and don't understand, well, you're probably not going to do too well on this. So hopefully you paid attention. What if we get half? Um, I might give partial credit. Here we go, and now the, the, the next chart I'm giving you is a little bit different than the chart before, so you have to use your brain. It's go time. Bro. Drew. Bam! That was money. There's the chart. Uh -huh. Why'd you give us a chart like that? It's different. you got to use your brain. I don't have oh. one. Okay. Here are the traits. Vascular tissue, seeds, and flowers. Just three traits. There are four organisms. Mosses, pine trees, flowering plants, and ferns. If they have a one in the space, that's like a check mark. Okay. So this says pine trees have vascular tissue. Why the heck are mosses up there if they don't have anything that? They don't have any of it. That's called your out group. Just trying to throw you off. Do you put that on there? Yes, you can put them on there. Do you have to? Yes. Have all four organisms on your clay of print. Give you a few minutes to work on. It's tough, I know. You want to hand in something that looks sort of like this. Thanks, I'm done if we're going to check them. You'll have to put it in the box. Uh, Let me look.
That's fine. You can do it like that. Okay. Oh, come check mine, please. Yeah, me too.
what uh, what flowers. Flowers. characteristic? Flowers. flowers comes after trees. Is there anything that has seeds but not flowers? Pine trees. Pine trees have vascular tissue and seeds, but not flowers, you see? So, pine trees are here. They have vascular tissue and seeds, but they didn't get flowers. And the last thing is flowering plants. Flowering plants have flowers and seeds and vascular tissue. They have them all. Could you add another branch and just put flowering plants? I mean, some of y'all did this like this. Yeah. Is that wrong? Flowering plants went here and you have nothing over here. Um, no, that's not wrong. I'll give that to you. Right. But you don't need that. You could, yeah. just, you could just have that. Like it's still going on. Kind of, so yeah. So let's see what this looks like. They actually had this in your book. Where is my... Uh, okay. <laughs> They actually had this on one of your pages. You could have looked at it. Uh, oh, right here. Four ninety six. Mosses, ferns, conifers. That's pine trees and flowering plants. And you see, this is the same one. They didn't have in that chart. They didn't have this characteristic. Did anyone find that? No, it's not. Yeah. Bro, what's a node? A node is an area of divergence from the rest of the group. Uh, so all a node is where it comes off. So there are three nodes in that? Exactly. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that's an evolutionary tree. And scientists have been using, this is a science. There's a right and a wrong answer to this. And scientists have been using this, these cladograms, to make these evolutionary trees. And there's video footage. <laughs> that is simple and considers ancestry and homologous characteristics not found in other organisms. Planists assume that each group has an ancestor that other species do not share. A small number of characteristics are used to define each group. That's, yeah, they got it going backwards from the way we just did it. Scientists use molecular data together with other lines of evidence to explain evolutionary history and current relationships. This example shows evolutionary trees of some mammals based on anatomy and molecular structure. Anatomical trees are based on physical characteristics. Molecular trees are based on molecular data, such as the amino acid sequences of proteins or the base sequences of DNA. These two methods generally agree. Notice how closely related the primates are to each other compared with kangaroos or sheep. So here's an evolutionary tree of organisms using methods like this. And you could see, actually, the tree on the left uses uh, anatomical similarities how organisms look and the tree on the right uses DNA evidence but you compare the trees and they're almost the same um, so there's ways depending on how you're making these trees there's ways of checking yourself with other trees made by other um, evidence this is made by DNA evidence that's your molecular tree this is made by anatomical evidence how things look and they got pretty much the same trees What's the first name or word in the yellow? Like R? Rhesus? Yeah, what's that? That's a rhesus monkey. That's rhesus. a... Uh, Why did it say the monkeys were closer to white? The, the monkeys are closer? Yeah. Uh, rhesus monkeys and gibbons, they have... They have the very... Monkeys. They're very similar. They both uh, eat leaves. It said like those were really close to the yeah, the sheep and the kangaroo, look how far away separated they are. They don't share a common ancestor until way back.